Uh, quick reminder, you were doing this worksheet last night, and I know a few of you had questions of it. Uh, again, reminder, uh, what we're doing here is we're taking this initial velocity of this ball, and we've talked a little bit about this already. The fact that if you break this into its vertical and horizontal components, this would be the horizontal part or piece or component of the velocity. I'll call that V sub x. And this part right here would be the vertical part. These two together would add up to that velocity we see, which I probably should have labeled um, as V for velocity. Um, what happens? Well, again, reminder, um, since gravity only affects the vertical part, since acceleration gravity is acting downward, what's going to happen as this thing flies? Um, the horizontal is going to remain constant, the V sub x part. But the vertical is going to get smaller on the way up, then get larger on the way down. How much more? Uh, well, you can kind of figure it out. At the very top, the question is, um, how does the horizontal component of the velocity compare for all these positions? The answer is, it's exactly the same. So V sub x for all of these is exactly the same as what it was when it started. What about the other parts? Well. Um, What's the value of the vertical component of the velocity at position B? It's zero. It's at the very highest point. It's no longer moving up. It's not moving down. It's horizontal for a brief moment before it begins to fall again. What's going to happen at point C? It's asking about the vertical component of the velocity. Um, it's going up. It's going to fall back down again. And at this point, it should have the same vertical velocity as it had when it took off. It's just going to be pointing in the opposite direction, sort of a negative of that. What would be the resulting velocity if you added those two vectors? Yeah, you can very quickly work it out. It would be a vector that would point, if you added the vectors, either adding this one to the tail of, or the tail of this one to the head of that one, or adding this top vector to the bottom one, putting its tail at the head of the other one. What's the resultant in this case? Uh, you would end up with a resultant velocity. It would look something like this. So this is the direction it would be traveling at this point. At the top part here, it's only moving this way. It's the only component of velocity it has. So it would be just equal to V sub x. But you kind of get the idea of the motion of a projectile. Um, it's also possible to add more than just two vectors. We've done two up to this point. Uh, you can actually add three vectors. So say, for example, you walk 10 meters north, then 10 meters east, then 4 meters south. How far away do you end up from where you start? Well, if you draw a quick little vector like this, you'll see that it's just kind of pointing over the, sort of in that direction. But if I asked you what the length of that one is, um, you might find it a little challenging to find. And you might say, wait, 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 is this law of sine, is there a law of, co law of cosines or something you learned back in geometry? You could do it that way, although it would be really, really hard because those are for triangles. Um, the easier way of doing this one is simply realizing, oh, wait a second. By the time I get done, from the time where I start here to where I end up, I really only end up six meters east of where I started. And so six meters over this way. And then I walk 10 north and 4 south. Oh, I just end up 6 meters north of where I started. Since this is a right triangle, you can now very easily figure out the length of this side. Um, it'll be 6 squared plus this 6 squared equals the hypotenuse squared. So it would end up being the square root of 36 plus 36, or 72. Um, which some of you are like, oh, you could write that 6 root 2. You're absolutely right. Or you could approximate it. It's about 8.5 meters. And if you wanted to, most of you could also figure out, hey, you're actually ending up at an angle of 45 degrees. That means exactly northeast of where you started. Because um, northeast right between north and east might be there. Yep, you got it. Um, what if it wasn't exactly 6-6? Six, six? Uh, then you'd have to do a little bit more work. Well, you do a little bit of trig. Uh, let's try one more. What about this one? 
in this case, you walk 10 meters north, 10 meters east, 5 meters north, 3 meters west, you end up here. Well, where is that relative to where you started? And most of you probably at this point are like, oh, wait a second, we could figure this out pretty quickly. Yeah, um, overall, you ended up going quite a ways north. How far north? Well, 10 meters north plus 5 meters north for a total of 15 meters. And then how far east did you end up? Well, you might say, oh, I went 10 meters east. Yeah, we went 10 meters east right here, but then we went 3 meters west. So we end up with 7 meters over here. Again, this is a right triangle. You could, at this point, uh, find the length of hypotenuse. Um, 7 squared plus 15 squared equals a hypotenuse squared. If you do that, I think you'll end up with about 18.7 meters is how far you would start away from that. And you could even figure out the angle. Now, this time it's a little bit more challenging. We always try to find the angle near the tail of the resultant vector. In this case, I think the easiest one to do is tangent. Remember that the tangent of an angle is equal to the opposite side, in this case 15, opposite that angle, over the adjacent side, which is 7. And if you solve this one, I, I don't have a calculator with me handy, but I think you'll end up with about uh, 67 degrees or somewhere maybe a little bit less than that. I'm just guessing. Uh, but you could, if you have a calculator, you could easily find it. What happens if I gave you this? Um, some of you might say, oh man, oh yeah, all you would do is move them head to tail. Um, so for example, I could move this 10 meter vector over to here and then move this 5 meter vector over to the end of this one, again head to tail. And it doesn't matter which order you add these in, and then the 3 meter vector to the end of that one, again head to tail. And some of you might say, wait a second, isn't this the one we just did? The answer is, yeah, you betcha. You. Um, and what's the resultant of this? If you added all of these together, the answer is it would still be the exact same vector we had in the previous problem. And it doesn't matter which order you add these, believe it or not, you would get the same resultant as long as you add them all head to tail. All right, this one's just a little bit more interesting. You're given three vectors up on top here, P, Q, and R. And the question, or the, the problem is, write an expression using these vectors for the resultant vector shown below. So in this case, A is the resultant vector. And the question is, what two vectors would you need to add to get A? Well, if you look at this vector down here, that sure looks like vector P. It's the same magnitude, same length, and the same direction. And this vector over here, wait a second, is vertical, like R is, but it's pointing in the opposite direction. And some of you might have guessed already, we did it in the other worksheet, this is just going to be negative R. Um, so what's A equal to? Well, it's equal to P minus R. And you're like, oh, okay, got it. I'm putting little vector signs on top. Let's skip that one and go all the way to E. So E, the resultant vector, is pointing down this way. Um, the question is, what two vectors would add to vector E? And if you look at these two vectors, you can sort of see it. Uh, what's happening in this case? This vector on top is exactly like P, but pointing in the opposite direction. And then this other vector here, pointing down this way, is pointing in the same direction as Q is, but in the opposite direction. So that is negative Q. So to get E, I need to add negative P plus negative Q, or I'm just going to write it as minus Q. Um, doesn't matter which order you put these in, you'd get the same resultant. And you could try the other ones real quick as well, but you get the idea. We've been adding position vectors up to this point, but um, you can also add velocity vectors. Anything that's a vector quantity you can add. And velocity is going to become really important in this chapter because we're dealing with projectile motion. So take a look at this. Most of you have been on planes before where they've got the rear screen monitors. And if you're not watching a movie or playing a game, uh, they actually have your flight statistics on the screen. 
And on it, they'll list your airspeed. That's how fast the plane is flying relative to the air. Your headwind or your tailwind, and then your ground speed. And you might say, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? Um, what's going on is this. 80 kilometers per hour is how fast this plane could fly in still air. It's its air speed. But in this case, there's a tailwind of 20 kilometers per hour. The wind's blowing from the back of the plane, helping it along. What's your resultant velocity relative to the ground? Well, your ground speed in this case, the sum of those two velocities would mean that you're actually going at 100 kilometers per hour relative to the ground. That's with the tailwind. What if you would have a headwind? Well, in this case, the, the headwind's acting against it. And I drew it side by side here instead of right on top of each other. Pretend this tail meets up with this head. The resultant in this case is only 60 kilometers per hour. So even though the plane is flying 80 kilometers relative to the air, since the air is moving against it, it only has a ground speed of 60 kilometers per hour. All right. So now what about this question? And here's a thought one before I give it. So plane, suppose your plane could normally fly at 80 kilometers per hour, but in this case, there's a wind coming from the side at a right angle at 60 kilometers per hour. What's that going to do to the ground speed of the plane? Will it be less than or more than the original 80 kilometer per hour airspeed? And if I draw this, you're probably going to see it right away. Um, it's going to be pretty obvious, I think. Um, yeah, the answer is it's going to increase it. Um, take a look at it real quick. If you add these two, and again, forgive me, I've got them tail to tail here. But if I move this 60 up here, uh, the resultant in this case is the 100 kilometers per hour. How'd they get the 100? Um, just good old Pythagorean theorem. Nothing too dreadful on that one. A couple of quick reminders of about a couple of our fun triangles. You might remember that there is a 3, 4, 5 triangle, which is one of those perfect triples. 3 squared plus 4 squared does equal 5 squared. Um, and the angle there, unfortunately, is not a very pleasant number. It's 37, or on this angle right here, it would be uh, the complementary angle of that one, 53 degrees. Likewise, one of the other ones you should remember is the... <laughs> 1, 1 root 2 triangle, the 45, 45, 90, uh, where the ratio of the sides are like this, and the angle here or on the top would be 45 degrees. Why am I bringing this up? Well, say for example I wanted you to add these two vectors. You go 10 meters exactly northeast, and then you go 5 meters north. How far away from the starting point do you end up, and at what angle? So for this one, you might say, oh, yuck, this time we could use the law of sines, although it would be painful. What can we do in this case? Um, here, I give you a hint. You can add vectors at angles by first resolving them into their vertical and horizontal components or pieces. In this case, it's the 10-meter one that's causing me the issues. Um, it's at an angle, and so I can't easily add it. But what I can do is, instead of adding the 10-meter vector, I could instead add these two component vectors. They get me started here and still end here, but adding these two vectors is a lot easier than adding this 10 at 45 degrees. The problem is now I need to find these two lengths. Um, and you might say, whoa, 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 where did you get that? Well, it's a 45, 45, 90. We know the hypotenuse is square root of 2 times larger. If you take 10 divided by the square root of 2, you'll get that. You might say, Ms. Klammer, I don't still get it. Well, you could do it this way. Uh, if you call this side y and this side x, you could use the trig. Remember again, sine of this angle is going to be opposite over the hypotenuse. Cosine of that angle is going to be the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. And if you solve these 10 times cosine of 45, 10 times sine of 45, you get that. It still doesn't give us our answer yet, though. Uh, but how can you solve this now? Well, if you look at it, take a look. You now have just a single right triangle. We know that we went 7.1 meters east of where we started. And we ended up 
7.1 plus 5, or a total of 12.1 meters north of where we started. Um, and so you can actually figure out, just old-fashioned uh, Pythagorean theorem, what the length of this side is, because we have a right triangle. And so 7.1 squared plus 12.1 squared gives us almost exactly 14.0. And if you wanted to find the angle in this case, how would you find it? The angle that this vector is at? Again, since we know the hypotenuse at this point, you could use any of your trig functions. But I always love tangent. Um, tangent of this angle is going to be equal to the opposite side, 12.1, over the adjacent side, 7.1. And again, I'm sorry I don't have a calculator with me, but um, maybe I put it on there. I didn't. But you could solve for the, th the angle down below. Just do the inverse tangent of that over that. Finally, uh, describing these things, sometimes describing the angle is not so obvious. So say, for example, I, went, I started out here and went 100 kilometers this direction. How do you describe this? Well, you've got, you know, north, south, east, west, the, the compass rows. Um, well, one way of describing it is this. This is 100 kilometers, 30 degrees north of directly east. So think about this. I went 30 degrees towards the north from directly east. So 30 degrees north of east. There's, of course, another way to describe this. You could do it this way. Um, it could also be described as this, as 60 degrees towards the east of directly north. So 60 degrees east of north. You're like, oh, okay. Either one of those completely describes it. You could also, I guess, if you wanted to, use your old-fashioned, you remember back from geometry, your coordinates? You've got 0 degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270. Um, you could possibly use that. However, I'm going to just give you one quick warning on these. If you just list the angle without listing a direction, um, it can get confusing. Why? Uh, for navigators, if you fly planes or if you sail boats, uh, bearings are completely different. North is 0 degrees. East is 90 degrees. South is 180 degrees. And West is 270. And so if you're not clear, if you just see an angle, you're not sure if it's a geometry angle or if it's a bearing angle, um, that's why oftentimes you'll see the sort of note of it's so much so far east of west or, or sorry, not east of west, <laughs> north of east or east of north. Um, and you might say, can I just call this northeast? And the answer is no. Why not? Well, northeast is, would be exactly 45 degrees between both of those, which is not what we're at in this place. All right. Um, this is a homework question, and I wanted to go through this one. The question here is, how long is vector d? Um, and you're like, what? Oh my goodness, it's all horrible. Well, we're just adding a bunch of vectors, but in this case, every single one of these vectors is at an angle other than horizontal or vertical. How are we going to fix it? We're just going to break each one of these into their vertical and horizontal pieces. You might say, whoa, 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 where'd you get these numbers? Uh, the answer is, is this vector is uh, 4.70 kilometers long. That's the hypotenuse. Uh, this is a right triangle. And the angle here um, I'm gonna, is 7.5 up there, which means it's also 7.5 down here, which means you can use your sine and cosine to easily solve it. Likewise, we can do the same with vector b, breaking into its vertical and horizontal pieces. Again, here it's easy to see the 16 degrees. It's the right triangle. So using sine and cosine again, you can do that. And then finally, vector c, we can do the same thing there. Breaking into its vertical and horizontal components, this angle here is 19 degrees. Opposite interior, if you want to think about it that way. Right triangle. This side is 3.02 kilometers. I guess I should write the other one on there, too. 
This one was 2.48 kilometers. And you might say, great, I got all of this. Now, how in the world do I actually solve it? Sorry, my PowerPoint wants to do other things. Um, well, now that we've broken these all into their vertical and horizontal components, we can actually add them up. If you add up all of the vertical components, you'll end up with 1.12 kilometers to the west. You've got this, this, and this. And if you remember, sort of think about the ones going to the left as negatives. If you add these up, negative 2.86 plus negative 0.68 plus positive 4.66, you'll end up with negative 1.12. Likewise, if you do the vertical, you'll discover it's about that. Um, same kind of way, make up positive, down negative, you'll discover the sum of all these um, is 2.75. Actually positive, but we, yeah, we're trying to figure out the length of this one downward. Um, and if you solve it, you'll discover it's about 2.97 kilometers, and theta is about 22.1. Um, how do we get to 22.1? Um, that theta there is the same as this theta here. Again, I'm just going to do the tangent. You could do the other one. But the tangent of theta would be the opposite side, the 1.12 divided by 2.75. And you should get that angle. Here's a thought problem. Uh, two vectors each have a magnitude of 6 newtons, and each makes a small angle alpha with the horizontal as shown. For students are discussing the resultant vector obtained by adding these. And I'm going to specify that, that alpha here is less than 30 degrees. It's a small angle. And the magnitude of both these, I kind of wrote it down here is at the end, but they're both 6. And alpha is measured there. So how do you find the resultant? Amanda says, since these are vectors, we need to use Pythagorean theorem to find the magnitude. In this case, it'll be 6 squared plus 6 squared, where the square root is 72, the direction will be downward. Bell says, since these are vectors, we have to find a magnitude and a direction. We use the vectors to determine the direction, which is down. But to get the magnitude, we add them. So we get 12. Conrad says, I think the direction is actually up. The resultant should add to these vectors to get 0. And since these two vectors point down, we need another vector pointing up. And then finally, Donald says the magnitude would be less than 6. Each of these vectors points down just a little, so the result will be pretty small. Pause the video if you want to think about it for a brief moment. I'm going to give you a countdown, then we'll talk about the answer. 3, 2, 1. Here we go. How in the world would you solve this one? Well, remember what we talked about before? With these kind of vectors, you can break each one into their horizontal and vertical components. So this would be this one over here, and I'll change the color and show the components of the other vector over here. What's going to be true about the sum of the two horizontal components? Well, since these are exactly the same angle and exactly the same hypotenuse, these two are going to be exactly equal and opposite. What's going to be the sum of these two? Um, the sum of these two horizontal ones are going to be 0. But we still end up with um, a vertical component. Now, this might be a little tricky, but if you remember your 3069s, or if you'll do a little bit of trig, if this angle was 30 degrees here, then this side here would be 6. But in this case, I told you that it is much less than 30. So the answer is going to be less than 6, which means what happens when we add these two together? Uh, we're going to end up with something down here. This is less than 6. That's less than 6. Our resultant, then, is going to be something less than 12 down here. Who had the right answer? Oh, sorry. Oh, so, so, so sorry. Ah, whoops, I just messed up. I'm so sorry. I, I was doing other things here. Um, this should be less than 3, not less than 6. Sorry, 30, 60, 90. This side's 6. This side's 6. This side has to be less than 3 if the angle is less than 30. It would be 3 if it was 30. And this one is going to have to be less than 3 as well, um, which means this is going to be less than 6. Who's the right answer on this one? Well, I would go with Donald. He didn't specify the direction, but he is correct in the fact that it's going to be less than 6. 
All right. We're moving into projectile motion, and I, I don't worry about the diagram too much. We'll talk about it in a second. But a projectile is any object that moves through airspace acted only upon by gravity and air resistance of any. So you see a projectile being launched here from a cannon. You kind of get the idea. We'll look at talk more about this in a second. Our goal in this thing is to describe the motion of this object, in, and it's moving now in two dimensions, both x and y. We're going to keep it simple by keeping the motion close to the surface of the Earth. Why? Um, that's going to mean gravity is going to be constant. It's going to be that negative 9.81 meters per second squared, or if we went around, whoops, if we went around a little bit, negative 10. Uh, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to neglect air resistance, meaning air resistance is going to be zero. <laughs> neglect means ignore. <laughs> uh, that makes our problem so much easier. So take a look at this cannonball that's fired horizontally. We talked a little bit about this already, but I just want to point this out. V sub x stands for the horizontal velocity of this cannonball as it flies, and it's represented by this vector, the horizontal vector as it goes. Notice that gravity does not affect it. It starts out 100 meters per second, it continues at 100 meters per second. On the other hand, take a look at the vertical component of the velocity. Um, it's increasing by how much each second? And you can see the vector actually growing in length as it falls. It's growing by 10 meters per second every second it falls. That's basically the key to projectile motion. You're like, wait, is it that simple? Yeah. The only difference is we can actually shoot the projectiles upward as well, in which case it has some initial positive vertical velocity as well. Um, how do we understand projectile motion? Well, take a look at it. Um, if you roll a ball along a frictionless surface, here's the motion map for it, it would move equal distances every unit of time. You're like, okay, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, they didn't draw the velocity vectors for this motion map, but you could if you wanted to. It would just keep rolling at a constant rate. And what happens if you drop a ball off of a tabletop? Sorry, that should be the same length. If you drop a ball off a tabletop, it gets going faster and faster and faster as it falls. And you're like, okay, so why are you showing these two things? Well, one of the big ideas in this chapter is gravity only affects the vertical. It doesn't affect the horizontal. So what are we going to end up with in this case? Take a look at this. And some students get completely baffled by this one. What if you rolled a ball off a table on a place where there was no gravity? <laughs> a free-falling elevator. In that case, it would just simply move equal distance each unit of time, but it would go in a straight line. It wouldn't go down towards the floor. What would happen if you dropped it? Well, yeah, it would accelerate, getting going faster and faster and faster and faster each unit of time. What happens when we combine both those? We get this path right here. But before you freak out and go, wait a second, we can never get to understand that, take a look at this again. The horizontal position is the same as just it was going without gravity. And the vertical is the same as what it does with gravity. So these spacings here are exactly the same as before. So you can actually predict where this thing's going to be at each moment. Here it is the first moment in time. Here it is in the second. Oops, sorry. Here it is in the second. Here's the first. Sorry, it doesn't leave the tabletop until the next second here. Um, so it's here just when it leaves the tabletop. And then it begins to fall. And the distance it falls is related to how far it would fall, even if it was just dropped straight down. You remember the demo we did already for some of you. Uh, the ball that's dropped falls at the same rate as the ball that's shot horizontally. They both would hit the ground at the same time. Key idea, here it is. If you had to pick one idea from the chapter, the horizontal component of the motion projectile is completely independent of the vertical component. Gravity accelerates the vertical component at this rate. The horizontal is not accelerated at all. It's moving at a constant velocity. And their combined effects produce everything we see. 
Take a quick look at this one. Here's a video. It's not exactly right, but we've got a ball rolling off a table. At the same time, somebody drops it just slightly late. But look at the, the vertical position of these two. They're almost exactly the same. Which one's going to hit the ground first? Well, they should hit the ground at the same time, but because the person released a little bit late, um, or actually a little bit early, it looks like, um, the one that's dropped from the table is going to hit the ground just a little bit early, even though they shouldn't if it was released at the same time. We've seen the demo already, so I'm not going to do it. Or if you haven't seen the demo, you'll see it in a moment. Um, so, but let me introduce this. Would this still work if you dropped the ball and shot a Nerf gun at the same time? And you're like, wait a second. Um, actually, to make it a little bit more similar, um, let's drop a Nerf bullet at the same time we fire a Nerf bullet. Which one would hit the ground first? Well, as long as you fire it horizontally, they'd hit the ground at the exact same time. And then every student's like, okay, I kind of get that. But then what would happen if you actually used a bullet and dropped a bullet at the same time? And people are like, no, 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 no. By the way, you'd have to have a really big flat space to do this so the bullet could actually fall all the way to the ground. Um, they're like, no, 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 no. With a real gun, this would not work. Um, the bullet that's flying, of course, would take longer than the bullet you just dropped from your hand. In reality, um, it's got to be the same. Physics should still work. So Mythbusters, some of you know the show already, actually attempted to test this one. So take a now you might say, wait a second, this actually broke physics. Um, this is actually not confirmed because they didn't hit exactly the same time. Well, believe it or not, Mythbusters made a mistake in this one. And it, it's very subtle, but it has to do with the gun. And if you didn't notice it, what's going on here? The gun, when it fires, has a little bit of backlash. It goes up. Why do I bring that up? Well, what happens to the bullet then? It actually gets fired at a slight angle, meaning that if you break it into its components, it was actually given a small amount, a very tiny amount, of a vertical velocity. Not much. I'm over, actually, maybe over, oh, whoops. Here's the horizontal part of it. Pretend that's a straight line. And here's the vertical part. But it actually had started up, it was moving upwards slightly, whereas the drop bullet started up from rest. And that's why the bullet from the gun landed just a little bit late. Um, if they had secured the gun a little bit better, it would have worked. I want to show you this one real quick. Compare the motions um, of the flare and the snowmobile in this scene. You can sort of see in this case the flare is launched vertically. Notice that the horizontal velocity the of the flare, horizontal velocities of the flare and remains the constant even as it scene. travels. And so it, it keeps up with the snowmobile. So How if the snowmobile is traveling at constant rate, the, the horizontal component of the velocity of the flare, flare stays launched. going at that same constant rate and lands equal with the snowmobile. Now, what would happen the if the snowmobile stopped? The flare it's the launched with some horizontal velocity. It keeps going with that horizontal. But now it's going to land in front. And then finally, of course, what would happen How if the snowmobile the speeds up after it gets launched? The flare keeps going forward with the same velocity, but now the snowmobile ends up further ahead. And um, I think that's where we're going to stop for today. We'll, we won't go into the more mathematical details next time. Good luck on the worksheet. I think you'll have fine. Uh, you can work on test corrections as well. And I'll see you soon.